I'd like to say hello to everyone. My name is Andre Castro. I'm the director of communications for Gamma. Thank you for joining us for today's press briefing regarding the transition of the piston engine aircraft fleet to an unleaded, unleaded future state. Um, the purpose of today's briefing, uh, I'm sorry, the briefing is being part of today's sponsors of the uh, Eliminate Gasoline Lead Emissions Initiative, Eagle Initiative, as well as uh, key general aviation stakeholders. Give me one minute while I share my screen. We'll go with that. Sorry, the purpose of today's briefing is to clarify the objectives of the Eagle Initiative, provide an update on the unleaded fuels currently reported by the Eagle, and uh, highlight the importance of stakeholder understanding of the new fuel and, and support deployment of use. Uh, we look forward also to answering your questions that you may have. Uh, today's agenda, you know, we will have a, a review of the Eagle objectives with the initiative's uh, co chairs, Mark Baker of AOPA and Larry Alou of the FAA. We'll have a status of four high octane unleaded fuel candidates by Leary Lou of the FAA. We'll have a manufacturer's perspective and needs with uh, Pete Bunce of Gamma. And also joining us is uh, John, John Calgano of Piper Aircraft, Shannon Massey of Lycoming, Ron Draper of Textron Aviation, and Patrick Horgan of Cupcrafters. Uh, that will be followed by the FBO distributor perspective and needs by Kurt Cast. Castanga, Castanga with NATA, apologize for that. And then uh, community perspective with Jack Pelton from EAA. And obviously we'll end the call with uh, Q&A. For Q&A, we ask that uh, when that time comes that you please go ahead and raise your hand or use the chat function to cue your question. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to Eagles co-chairs, Mark Baker and Liria Liu. Thank you, Andre. Andre, uh, we're here today uh, to keep a collective uh, update about all the efforts that have been going on to move to an unleaded future for general aviation. But we're making progress. There's still a lot to be done. As a reminder, the GA associations and the FAA established the EAGLE initiative in late 2021. EAGLE has a clear goal and a mandate to eliminate lead and aviation fuels no later than 2030, and hopefully sooner. No one in GA wants to defend the lead, and it's time to get rid of it. EGLE does not support one fuel in the approval process. We support the fuels that will help us reach our goal of a high, act high octane fuel, unleaded fuel that works for the entire GA piston fleet. We currently have four candidate fuels evaluated, two through the FAA Supplemental Type Certificate, otherwise known as SDC, and two through the FAA Piston Aviation Fuel Initiatives, otherwise known as PATHI. We are pleased that one fuel, GAMI's G100UL, received the SDC from the FAA for use in almost all GA piston aircraft. GAMI is now working through a complex process of commercialization, and the process to bring 100 octane unleaded fuel to the nation's airports. That includes production, transport, and storage. I know that GAMI has invited engine manufacturers and FBO representatives to its facilities to learn more about the fuel. Hopefully that will occur soon. It's important that this unleaded transition be safe and smart. It is vital that local airports and airport sponsors to provide the supply of 100 LL during the transition for those aircraft that need higher octane to safely fly. We're pushing back in those airports and communities that are prematurely banning 100 low lead before a replacement of unleaded fuel is widely available. The most important element of this transition is safety. I've said it again, I'll say it again a hundred more times. If we're easy, it's been done a long time ago. With that, I turn it over to my partner, Leo Liu, co-chair with the FAA. Thanks, Leo. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And actually, I'm glad you went first because you got to spell out all the acronyms so I don't have to do it. <laughs> so anyway, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. I'm Leo Liu. Uh, I am head of the aircraft uh, certification service within the FAA. Um, and along with, and I'm also the co-chair for EGLE, which has been spelt out, which is the Eliminate Aviation Gasoline Lead Emissions Program. I would have to admit uh, it's a good acronym because I think it's what we want to do and actually uh, um, makes sense. So along with my fellow co-chair, Mark Baker, um, the two of us are the, uh, the uh, EGLE chairs and, and happy to be a part of this. First off, I'm pleased that we're having this event today. Um, it's good for us to be able to provide some additional information and clarification to the efforts that we're doing toward developing a viable candidate for the unblooded fuels to replace the 100 low lead, um, as we said in the, in the piston engine fleet today, that's quite large. So as, as Mark alluded to, 
We do have two pathways available to obtain FA authorization with the use of the new fuel. And, and of course, we're using the PATHI program, which has been set up uh, by Congress. But then we also have the traditional approach that is the type certification process. And then later on, I'll talk a little bit about where we are in the state of play there. But there are a few differences between these two pathways to approve the use of the fuel. And through the traditional STC or, or approved model list uh, process, um, we also have our fleet authorization process through the PAFI. And as a result, we've developed a chart um, that can show and lay out the various attributes of each to truly distinguish um, what they both have benefits to, but where there are differences. Um, and we'll be able to, to post that on the new Eagle website, um, which is debuting today. I think that's one thing we wanted to highlight and you'll hear more about it, that we are actually uh, rolling out with a website that'll be uh, accessible for information there. And so you'll see uh, that chart available, but if needed, uh, we can also talk through that. Now, through our traditional SDC and AML process, uh, an applicant's responsible for demonstrating the aircraft and the engines meet all the requirements using the new unleaded fuel. And the FAA reviews the compliance data and issues an approval, um, the SDC, which the applicant then can sell uh, to customers to modify their individual aircraft to authorize the use of the fuel. And the modifications includes the change to the fuel placard, the limitations, and can affect the attributes, other attributes, depending on what the SDC may entail. Now, under the fleet authorization process, as it's known as, as for PAFI, um, fuels are evaluated through a collaborative industry government testing program called the Piston Aviation Fuels Initiative, and the testing procedures and results are shared uh, throughout the PAFI partners, um, which includes the engine and the airframe OEMs, and is intended um, to provide them the access with the information to be confident in the use of the new fuels. Upon successful completion of the testing, the FAA will issue this fleet authorization, which allows aircraft owners to, um, to understand that they can use um, what they need to do to use to modify their individual aircraft to authorize that use of that fuel. So um, making sure I'm still on track here. Um, we plan to authorize, now since the conclusion of the past PAFI testing um, is not proprietary, the flight authorization also provides information directly to the owners of the aircraft with the special restricted uh, experimental airworthiness certificates so they can modify their aircraft. Um, but we plan to authorize the use of uh, lower octane unleaded fuel, which is the UL-91, um, later this year through a fleet authorization process. And that'll facilitate broader use uh, and experience with the transition. So use of the lower octane, um, other than uh, 100 low lead, we expect approximately about 68% of the general aviation fleet will be able to use the UL-91. So that's just my quick introduction, although it seems long, but uh, happy to be a part of this. Um, do we want to, I'll turn it back over to you, Andre. Next, I have the status of the four high octane unleaded fuel candidates. Okay, well, I guess you're coming back to me. Yes. Um, and so on that, I kind of was rolling into that from the start, just even saying what the differences are and as Mark had talked to as well. Um, so let me just give you a little quick status of where we are. Um, and I think it's important to note, there are four developers. Um, we've got two uh, developers that are working through um, the, the process is we've identified PAFI, which is a, a set up through Congress. And then we have two that are working through the STC process. Um, the fuels that are pursuing the fleet authorization through the Piston Aviation Fuels Initiative, and those are all just terminology like fleet authorization. In the end, it's a matter of providing approvals to be able to allow uh, the aircraft to the fuel to be used. But with the two companies that are in that program are Afton Chemical, uh, Philip 66, and then Lionel Vassell uh, VP. And as a part of our uh, the PATHI initiative under the Eagle umbrella, we are working with the teams from these two companies to test and evaluate the high octane unleaded fuel solutions. Both teams have completed extensive testing um, and then fine tuned their fuel formulations uh, based on some feedback uh, as they've seen. And uh, they're in the final initial phase of testing to, is underway now uh, with the Lionel Fuels at the Tech Center. And testing for the Afton Phillips 66 will begin shortly at one of our producing engine manufacturer facilities. So things are really quite moving along there on the, under the PAFI umbrella. And then um, the fuels that are pursuing a um, approved model list STC, supplemental type certificate, through our traditional FA certification process, we have um, the um, one under and GAMI, they, we issued an approved model list, a supplemental type certificate back in September of 2022 to GAMI for 100 octane unleaded fuel, which is called G100UL for general aviation aircraft. We were also working with Swift Fuels on an STC for an unlimited number of aircraft and engines to operate on uh, high octane unleaded fuel, which is 100R later this year. 
So I'd also like to clarify that regardless of the approval path that's chosen by um, the uh, producers, um, the FAA does not approve the fuel itself. We approve the use of that fuel, which is identified through fuel specifications. Um, we allow the two types of fuel specifications, either an industry standard, which is ASTM right now currently is recognized, and an independent standard as well. So we're also posting a summary of the types of specifications um, that are allowed and what that entails on, on the website. So you'll be able to see that as well, another chart that helps to depict those differences. And historically, aviation fuel has been sold kind of as a commodity. Um, it's produced by various stakeholders um, to the industry standards. Um, and recognizing that some fuel developers choose to control the production of the fuel that they develop an independent specification provides a similar path and while keeping the information concerning the fuel under um, the control of the developer. So I think that that provides a little bit of background where we are with the, uh, with the four fuels that we have running through the process at this moment. So I'll turn it back to you, Andre. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Pete, I'd like to go ahead and hand over the floor to you for the manufacturer's perspective and needs. Well, thanks, Andre. You know, for all of our our friends in the aviation press that we've invited here today, one of the things that's concerned me over the last year or so is just we as as the association leaders that have been in Eagle along with our FAA colleagues haven't gotten a lot of questions uh, that have come in. And, and so we wanted to provide this opportunity to give you some information along with the launch of the website so that we can develop more transparency in this process. As my buddy Mark Baker always says, if this was easy, we would have had had it accomplished already. We've been at this for a long time. When we formed PAFI uh, back in the last decade, we set the parameters to be able to look at the corner cases and be able to have fuels come in and be offered to be able to go against the testing criteria that all the associations develop, whether it's rotorcraft or fixed wing aircraft, to be able to be safe. Um, it wasn't the job of GAMI to develop the fuel, or I'm sorry, PAFI to develop the fuel itself, but to test what was being offered uh, to us. And so this was all set up. Well, we're at a point in time now where we have SDC applicants along with the PAFI uh, applicants as Lurio had pointed out, but, but transparency is very important for us as manufacturers. For a century now, we've been designing then testing, then certifying air, aircraft and engines. But the paramount rule in this is that they are safe and we have to prove that to the FAA. And so as, as we go through this process, the way we've done this is we have had known fuels. And since World War II, we've had 100 octane fuel and then we were able to go to 100 low lead but we were able to certify and test those against this standard. And that standard has been given to us by ASTM. It's been a, a fuel standard that has been out there and developed and everyone has had confidence because there's a consensus process to be able to go and provide that fuel. We're into new territory now. So we thought it would be valuable for, for you all to have our captains of industry in the, in the aviation manufacturing room, OEMs from both the airframe and the engine side, to be able to talk to you about what the importance is of this transparency to know certain things. We need to know the chemical composition of fuels. We need to know what the minimum spec is. There are several very important things that we know, we need to know to make sure that our customers are safe when they're flying these aircraft. So I'm, it's a, a pleasure for me to have the leaders of, of Piper, uh, Lycoming, Textron Aviation, and Cubcrafters with us today to be able to go and give you those perspectives. So I'd like to, to start with John Calcagno, um, the head of Piper. And John, you're up. Good. Thank you, Pete. So this is a great program. I'm, I was very honored to be a co-signer of it. Um, and, and this is something we need to do as an industry and as a country we need to do. Um, so with that said, Piper's primary obligation is to our customers. The customers come first here at Piper. I, and I'm sure that that's the case with a lot of the, my colleagues within, within the Gamma uh, membership. Um, with that said, continued operational safety and support of our fleet, providing timely customer support, customer questions, technical support, um, all of those things are part of that. And a new fuel has broad impact across the entire aircraft and its performance. Uh, in our history, we built over 140,000 aircraft. 
of which 80,000 are still flying. Think about that. 80,000 are still flying. And the vast majority of them come from the general aviation heyday, which is well over 20 years ago. Um, is, is, a, is an industry we're really not producing that many aircraft today compared to what we used to produce. So the aircraft that are going to be affected are the older ones. The owner base is different. The customer base is different. But no matter whether you bought a Piper from us this year, last year, or 50 years ago, you are still a Piper customer and you're valuable and, and you matter to us. We want to make you happy. Um, a new fuel will be um, really really have an effect on those customers more so um, than some of the modern customers that we hear from. Uh, with that said, we are getting a, getting several questions already related to this from our fleet schools, uh, as you can imagine. Um, we need to have an understanding of the specific tests that we're going to have to conduct to evaluate the fuel in order to determine what additional data and ind independent tests that we may, do, may need to address for our business needs or specific testing our, of our aircraft models. But again, the mass majority of the aircraft that we have built in our history, we're not building today. Uh, we're building a handful of aircraft models today, but the vast majority of our of our fleet is aged and, and we're, not long, we're no longer producing. Um, so this is gonna be very important that, that we get this right. Um, so in our case, many flight schools that continue to ask this, they're also asking for support from us as, as, it, as this continues to come out, having more answers will be better. I know we're still searching for a lot of answers, but it'll be important. But we're also getting questions from insurance companies, financial institutions, everybody associated with the purchase of an aircraft and the aircraft ownership experience. Um, the fuel is very different from a traditional change to our aircraft. We know how to make changes to our aircraft. We know how to get things TC'd, working with the FAA. This is different. A wholesale fuel change is not a typical incremental product improvement. Uh, it's an outside requirement, not within our normal span of control for type certificates. Um, engines are affected. Everything where the fuel gets placed, everything is affected with this. And it's not like a car. We all understand it has to work 100% of the time. 99.9% .9 is not acceptable. Um, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. We can't have any of them. Um, so the customers don't know the details regarding a different school, different fuel. Um, they don't know what's being made. Uh, but they just completely, they, they, they come into an FBO, they fill up, and that's what they do. They just rely on the fuel to be right. They're not going to go asking questions about what kind of fuel is this and that for the most part. Um, we really think that we don't want to take that away from them. They should still be able to do that. And I think even if we were to try and regulate that, customers would still just go fuel, go fill up. Um, a lot of them won't have a choice um, based on the airports that, they, that they're utilizing. Um, so we're going to we're going to we as a an entity, once further information comes forth, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to provide more technical support that for individuals that use these. Also, there's warranty coverage related things in some of the modern fleet areas um, and continued operational support. Um, that is kind of just an overall perspective, but certainly um, uh, certainly would be available privately after the call to have any handle any other questions um, that, that we may have. I will hand this over next to my colleague, Shannon, at Lycoming. Hey, thank you, John. And thanks to everyone on the call. One, not only for participating, uh, but also my compliments to the FAA industry and championing the Eagle, which we are definitely a partner of that. Lycoming Engines, I think most everyone is aware, we're getting ready to come into our 95th year next year in general aviation piston engine segment. We are proud and we have held true to the fact that we build every engine as though we're going to go fly it ourselves. And to be able to do that, that means the safety and reliability of all users behind a Lycoming engine. We want to ensure that product with whichever fuel is being used is within the safety margins that we've tested and certified. Um, so we need to ensure whether it's through industry slash government, the PAPI authorization process, or via the supplemental type certificate, the STC process, that we have a good understanding and knowledge of what specific tests and which models of engines are evaluated. So then that way we can stand behind that portion of it. Lycoming holds type certificates to over 650 engine models, um, just a few uh, out there from that perspective. And with over 100,000 of those active type certificate engines still in the fleet, um, and that's just what's reported out there on the FAA's registry. 
that doesn't mean that there's others that are still flying that just aren't registered anymore. In addition to that, we also have experimental aircraft that are flying and powered behind a light coming engine that also require a higher octane demand. So, you know, when you think about all of those engine models, those that are actively out there flying, those whether they be certificate or not, over half of those require a high octane fuel. So it's important to note that when you look at those, those are also most of the aircraft and the fleet that are the workhorses out there in the fleet, right? They are ferrying supplies to remote locations, they're patrolling borders, they're supporting military operations. So by all needs and demands, they're really in, in key. The loss of the ability of these airframes to service society would definitely be impactful, uh, which is why we, as an OEM of the engine providers, are looking to make sure that we know under unleaded fuels and the development that's taking place in those, what are those key characteristics that we need to be considering? Octane is only one of those characteristics. Other key characteristics include toxicity. You know, so we don't want to replace one fuel for another one that's going to be harmful, whether it be to the environment or to the public. We also need to think about materials compatibility. You know, O-rings, hoses, fuel batters, you know, whether there's corrosive properties um, that may impact the other metals within our engine and or on the airframes. Um, the other thing to think about is a distillation curve. Fuel's ability to vaporize at any given temperature. That's key if we're looking for startability, runability, and vapor lock concerns. You know, as John pointed out, these are not engines and or aircraft that can only work 99% of the time. Everyone is expecting them to operate 100% of the time. The other thing that's kind of key here that people don't think about is density, right? So there's the kind of that rule of thumb, apologies, six pounds per gallon, you know, as a rule of thumb, well, aromatics, which is some of the things that we're seeing in some of these fuel alternatives are actually heavier than what you have in your 100 low lead. So then the question is going to be, is there going to be a center of gravity which varies um, with the users in the airframe? The other part of that from us specifically as an engine is the fuel controls. So when you think about a denser fuel, um, we have to assume what that volumetric flow is held constant. And fuels with increased density will exhibit higher mass flow rates and thus higher fuel air ratios. So fuel controls would have to be adjusted to accommodate a denser fuel to maintain the appropriate air ratios for predictability and safe operations. So I think that's the thing, you know, you'll hear me talk about as I go through this, you know, whether it's density, toxicity, materials capability, stability, right? What happens when this fuel is stored in a storage tank? We need to ensure that that octane doesn't evaporate and then therefore you end up getting deposits, which then can, you know, end up blocking jets and filters and sticking valves. These are all different considerations that without us having the knowledge base and able to characterize and or know by standardized testing method, what does that mean and how does that impact our current ones that are out there? You know, and so not to belabor, obviously there's also that producibility. We need a fuel that's producible and repeatably producible with the same properties so that we know that once we've tested and or validated those material specs, that it's gonna perform the same way time and time again without that. I think the really key characteristic is a mature specification. Um, you know, groups such as ASTM and SAE, they're international, they're consensus-based organizations with cross-functional involvement. Um, and so it's a vehicle for standard development. Now, does that mean that like homing, you know, requires that every fuel have an ASTM spec? We don't, but what we do require is that a producer provide data that is proprietary, that has met those requirements, whether it's been mature, whether it's been tested in all the different envelopes, and that we get that cross-functional input without which we can't certify any fuel as an operating limitation. All boundaries, of all boundaries of possible fuel production within a given spec needs to be tested so that we can inform customers that the engine and airframe will perform as designed and predicted throughout the range of altitude, our weather conditions, and any other possible opportunity. It's not just the fuel's property values vetted, but the tests measure those values 
and determine that they're accurate, that they're repeatable, and that the precise results, regardless of whatever laboratory was utilized within that piece of it. I think that's what's really critical to note is, you know, we've stood behind that we build every engine as if we're going to fly it ourselves to be able to do that. It's important that we have that material specs so that we can compare that within our safety and margin of the engines that we've already certified. So I will also offer any questions or comments. I know we have a Q&A period as well, but in the interim, I'll turn it over to Ron Draper from Textron Aviation. Well, thank you, Shannon. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Uh, Textron Aviation, home of Cessna and Beechcraft brands. Um, hopefully we need no introduction with this group. Uh, we've built over 250,000 airplanes in our history. We currently have 20 models in production from jets down to uh, small training aircraft. The vast majority of those 250,000 airplanes are still uh, in service today with an enormous installed base. I would just echo the comments of both Piper and Lycoming, and I, I, won't, I won't repeat them uh, in an effort to save time and not, not be redundant. But we're very excited about the innovation that's occurring in fuels. We're very excited about the objectives of Eagle and the future of an even more sustainable uh, environment for general aviation going forward. I would agree that we have to do that in a very, very safe manner. So the, uh, I guess the one thing you're hearing from all OEMs in this process as we look at this innovation in new fuels is we desire more transparency. We desire the ability to test these fuels. To date, we've been unable to test any of these fuels in our airplanes. Of course, all of our collective customers are asking us, how's it gonna affect performance? How's it gonna affect durability, et cetera, et cetera. And to date, we've been unable to do that. And we're eager, our engineering groups are eager to get these fuels and start testing them to answer those questions. We have tested fuels in the past that have a similar but different recipe. Uh, and we had, we had some results that were, um, I guess, less than desired. Uh, in the past, some of those fuels did have wear and, and tear on uh, soft materials in the airplane, uh, O-rings, gaskets, hoses, bladders, sealants. And we're unsure of these new fuels, what it's going to do to the engines and what it's going to do to the airplane. So we're very eager to uh, support this effort, move forward with testing, uh, but we really, really need more transparency before, uh, as an OEM, we can endorse the conversion uh, to these fuels in our aircraft. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Cub Crafters. Thanks. Uh, it's Pat Horgan with Cub Crafters, and, um, I, and I think uh, John and, and Ron aptly covered most of the OEM concerns. I had a few. We're in a bit of a unique position. We're building in four different category segments. Uh, FAA certified, as well as uh, light sport ASTM, experimental builder assist, and we build kits. And each one of those has different standards that are applied. In all cases, with safety being at the forefront of all this, um, the transparency, I just want to echo the transparency and the need uh, to test. And uh, we have not as well, just as, uh, just as Ron mentioned, we have not had the opportunity to test these. And there's there tends to be some assumptions in terms of materials that are in fuel systems that are not that are particular to one airplane to another. They're not just universal. And when you're building a backcountry airplane where we're we have many federal uh, government customers using our airplanes for law enforcement and humanitarian missions and you know, in backcountry areas, there's lots of questions about safety and reliability in terms of anything that changes in the core of fuels. And to be responsible for that, of course, we need uh, confidence and a blessing from our, our engine manufacturer. So Shannon, Shannon's blessing uh, for the engines that she builds us, she builds us several every couple of days. Uh, we've, we've obtained four newly issued TCs in the last decade. We hold 60 some STCs and, and continue to expand our production. And there's a, there's a continuing interest of our customers and potential customers asking a lot of questions. And to, to gain the answers to those questions, we need synergy on, trans, on the on transparency 
And uh, to be able to do this, the easiest way is, of course, we support this. And the easiest way is in all of our support documents to be plug and play. We can put this fuel in the existing airplanes and the new airplanes we're producing. And, uh, and to be able to make the significant business decisions we have and to be able to test and get, get on that, we just need general transparency and the ability to test the materials so that we can ensure that some of the presumptions that have been made from the aircraft OEM side are being met. And uh, I think we're all we're all on the same page there. And I appreciate the opportunity. We're supportive. We're appreciative of the joint leadership with uh, with the FAA and GAM and AOPA and EAA uh, all on the same call. That's that's brilliant to have that kind of cooperation. I think we all want the same things. And uh, hopefully we can uh, we can move forward to checking the minimum boxes uh, so that we can all have the confidence we need from a safety standpoint. Well, thank you, Pat and and Ron, Shannon, and John. Uh, I think you've seen the the theme here, and we're going to pass it to Kurt Kasanga for uh, for the perspective uh, from the FBO and the fuel distribution chain. Just one point I wanted to make uh, to Shannon's. Uh, comment about our concern about what we emit into the atmosphere and making sure that we don't solve one problem and buy ourselves another problem. And our compliments to Lurio and the FAA team that they are. Uh, and, and Lurio, if you just want to comment uh, on the group that you've uh, that you're working with and then uh, National Academy of Sciences to be able to to look at this. Finding the button, I got the mute. Uh, no, thank you. Actually, uh, I know we're going to try to go through the uh, the rest of the agenda and let everyone speak to it. But I uh, I think everyone and appreciate the insights that uh, the um, manufacturers provided. I think one thing, maybe I interject it now. I think what's important is, you know, the reason why this hasn't happened in the past is because you can see it's complex. There's a lot of factors go into it, and just as you said, it's the design, manufacturing, and interface activities, um, and then it's the operational side. And actually making sure that we're not spending an effort to be able to replace something that's going to be just as hazardous in a different effect. So um, we are looking, and I, and I won't talk too much on it, but we are having a, a work with the National Academies and Science to be able to further look into this issue. Um, we have um, our interagency partners also looking into the hazardous uh, effects of this. So there is attention put in this this area. So Pete, I'll let us get on schedule and then come back to that if that's easier. But looking Thanks, forward Ariel. to the final discussion. Kurt, over to, Kurt, over to you for for your perspective. Thanks, Jack. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone and representing the FBO um, industry and our um, approximately 3,300 members that really are the nexus where the OEM expectations for transparency and the fuel sellers that are really gonna deliver this fuel into the wing of the consumer's airplane come together. and. I completely agree with the uh, comments that have been made relative to the need for that transparency. From our perspective, um, as, as Lirio mentioned early on, historically aviation fuel sold as a commodity um, is really um, done and delivered to the airports and FBOs through the fuel distribution network, where those entities are relying on today the four major fuel suppliers that are delivering that fuel to bring them a fuel that has for the last many decades met an ASTM standard. And uh, traditionally, much of the stakeholder understanding and acceptance of fuel is gained as the developers work through these ASTM consensus standard process to obtain what we've heard today is, I'll, I like the word, a mature production specification. So that process really includes uh, the committees for looking at aviation fuels that include the manufacturers, the producers, the distributors, the providers, and the other subject matter experts regarding aviation fuels who will conduct these peer re review assessments for the proposed fuel definitions and test reports. And, you know, I think it's great that we have this time with the media today, because as we've all read that we know there's a race to establish this one fuel and there's expectations by the uh, users that are buying fuel today, where we're, where FBOs and airports are hearing from both their user constituents and then their outside the fence community um, interest that are looking to see lead um, removed. And all of us here today in the industry are, are unified in removing that lead. It's how we get there. And from our perspective, the importance of a fuel standard 
um, in the collaborative consensus process to support really the risk and liability protections is what's needed as we go to sell this fuel. FBOs and airports, when they receive a load of fuel, they receive a load that has a manifest and it tells that FBO that the fuel going into its tank meets a certain specification. In order for us to get to the user competence for the aircraft engine manufacturers and for the users who are flying those airplanes and the FBOs that are selling the fuel, we need to reach that position where we have a level of competence in the fuel specification that it meets a standard um, so that the respective risk and liabilities can best be assured ultimately to deliver a safe fuel product um, where we continue to enjoy the safety um, and, and miss risk mitigation measures we've had with good fuel quality. So with that, I'll pass it over to my good friend, Jack Pelton. There, I think I'm alive now. I seem to always be the one with the unmute problem, but, uh, you know, thank, thanks, uh, Kurt and, and everyone for the comments up to this point. I, I, I think there, it's interesting. There, there seems to be a, a common theme around here and that's the ability to, to get the fuel to test. One, one of the things that we're looking at at EAA is the community impact and, and what is obviously very important to us is making sure that the fuel solution is something that's available for all airplanes. Um, we know that as consumer demand uh, and distribution starts keying up that availability of fuel will become better and better. But one of those key pieces of availability and acceptance will also be the, the economics of the fuel. So we need to uh, understand if the new fuel is economically viable, which we haven't really gotten any data back uh, on that yet because no one is producing it in mass or or, or and the ingredients are, are still uh, under under uh, tight, tightly wrapped because it's done through the, the STC process. One of the things we found in this, I think the FA did a great job of creating another path to get fuel certified in, in the STC process. And I think going into this, we were all very anxious that uh, that could be a, a way to get there quicker. But we have found what we have all found out is that it does leave a lot of airplanes on the side on the side not not to get my friends ron and other people upset but certainly one of the fastest growing segments of aviation today is the eab community um, we're registering over twenty thousand on an annual basis um that or excuse me over a thousand annual basis but there's over thirty thousand on the on the register the stcs are not applicable to experimental amateur built aircraft you, you cannot uh, apply an stc to those airplanes so we're in a unique situation along with LSAs that in order for us to use the STC fuel, fuel we want we need one, the, the applicant of the STC to provide uh, to us in the FAA the, the specific ingredients in the fuel. And then we have to go do the compatibility testing uh, for the systems that are in those given airplanes. In most cases, the STC that's out there today covers almost all airplanes, or I believe all airplanes except rotorcraft and uh, EABs and, and helicopters will soon be coming around. So we we can probably find the applicable engine and, and have a compatibility understanding of that for the given engine. But then we've got to go look at the fuel pumps and the, or the like Ron mentioned, all the soft stuff in the airplane and apply as the EAB uh, builder to the FA to certify to get the certified fuel onto our airplane. And it requires us to actually go flight test. So this is a huge, huge issue as far as the uh, acceptance and being able to put it on an EAB because just most people are not going to want to be, they've already been aircraft testers and building the airplane, but now to also be a fuel tester is, is really a stretch too far. Um, the way around that, of course, is to get an FAA fleet authorization on the fuel. And that's, we feel that, that from a commercialization is really, really required to make that happen. Um, not only are the EABs left out, but also LSAs along with the experimental um, exhibition category of warbirds, um, they would not be able to use an actual STC to do it, to be able to use it. So we're, we're concerned that the pathway as we sit today is very unclear or, at the, or the clarity that we do have on it is very cumbersome, not making it really a, a very viable commercial option for, for our community. So we really need to work on getting that uh, lead authorization process in place, which you know, some of the fuels are going down that path. We like to also make sure that, that all of them do. So we, we do have a clear, clear answer on that. That's really my comments from a 
community standpoint that are that are certainly concerning. And I think it alleviate we my point really is to make sure that from the press standpoint, we we there's lots of articles out there that are commenting that the solution's in hand for everybody. Let's go. Let's just start putting putting fuel in airplanes. And that is not the case for all airplanes. So with that, I think I'm giving it back to uh Andre uh as our as our host here for the Q and A with the uh the media. Yes, thank you, Jack. And at this time, I'll you know raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Fred, I, I see you. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Folks, uh, thank you for doing this today. I, I, you know, my big concern from here is that it appears that none of the candidate fuels have been produced in sufficient quantity for long-term testing. I mean, for example, if I still had the Bonanza and I was flying it from here to Oshkosh, Jack, I'd surely want to know that whatever I'm putting into that little 550 is uh, going to be compatible with the engine. What's it going to take for the general aviation community, the, the air framers, the fuel suppliers, and the engine makers to get enough fuel to run several dozen engines from brand new right through overhaul and then tear them down? and determine whether or not the fuel is safe from what you see from the inside guts of the engines. Well, I'll, I'll take the first shot at that, Fred. Um, the PAFI program is designed to do that. So our in, all, all of our manufacturers um, are giving resources to the PAFI program in kind to be able to do, do that. One of the SCC companies is also pursuing an ASTM standard that will have a peer review and be able to meet the, that criteria. If we as an industry come up with another standard out there, it'll probably be the same personnel from the different elements of our industry to be able to look at that. But you're absolutely right. You have to have that confidence and we have to have the fuel available with the proper transparency for us to do this confidence building. You know, we expect the FAA, if they're issuing an SDC, to be able, that they've done, they've done their due diligence and they've tested, but there's ultimately our responsibility to look at it and be able to evaluate it. And that's how we want to be able to do confidence building with all of our manufacturers, looking at the transparent requirements that they'll need to make their own determinations on the suitability of all those parts and pieces of, of the whole airframe and the engine that was talked about. And uh, Lurio, you want to add to that? No, I think it's it's a great question. It's what we've all been working with. And I think that's really the reason why Eagle was set up because, um, and there is a slide and maybe I'll ask Andre if you can pull that up. It's that slide that shows, you know, what we do for certification, what do you do to actually distribute? What's the two parts that has to come together so that we can actually get a fuel to uh, the fleets out there? And I, and I, that's not that one. It's the third one down there. The one that's got the keep going. Next one, next one, this one. I like this. I mean, cause um, as we're trying to understand, as we've already said, it's a complex com complex activity. Um, the SDC is, is already just a mechanism to uh, provide some level of assurance that there's been a review to some components of it, but that's just one, one aspect. Then it is again, you ask the question, how do you make sure you get enough fuel so you can actually produce it? I think you have to get also the the, the producers to decide that, okay, this is a value for me to actually produce it and to what, you know, to what level and which one and where. Um, and then you have to be able to have enough fuel out there so you could actually uh, look at the characteristics, so you could actually develop a good standard. So all the pieces of these puzzle, of the puzzle that go together, have to come and get to the same point at the same time. And I think that's what Eagle is trying to do. It was set up to facilitate bringing us all together, understanding our concerns and, and issues and, and getting our activities synced so that we can address the issues. One of the things I'll say um, as you look at this, and again, this I think could be something we might put on the um, the website because I think it's simplistic enough to try to just say it is complex and even this doesn't depict all the complexities. But um, if we could take, go ahead and take that off, I can like to see people. Um, what I would like to say, what we're doing, a couple of things that you know Pete asked about. There's a couple of pieces that I know that the FA is taking on is trying to put um, some of those puzzle pieces in play. 
Um, there are um, activities going on, at least with some of the, uh, the fuel um, manufacturers, the STC ones that are providing them to some testing to some manufacturers to gather some more data. The FA is also looking to do more um, with some of the funding to be able to see how we build confidence, to be able to provide a way that we can um, incentivize the production so that we can have the fuel so that we can get it out there to test. Because as I said, it's the manufacturers, those that, are, that are, have got the responsibility to be able to see how it interfaces in these other attributes, the material compatibility, um, as, as was really well described by Shannon. I think all of those are important aspects. So again, we're gonna provide some funding so that we can actually get some more fuels. So I know you're shaking your head. And so I know that's one thing. We've also, the other, other question that comes out is the hazards. So we've got an NSA study that's also doing the same thing. We're gonna be contracting that so that we can be able to um, get together the right people. It's with our uh, environmental organization that's taking the lead on that. Um, to pull together uh, a, a workshop so that we can share with the distributors on, on the attributes of what we would see is, is, is important. So I can't say that it happens overnight. That's why Eagle has been set up, is to bring the stakeholders together so that we can understand what each of our concerns are and be more transparent about how we're sharing, what we've done, and what's the, the missing gaps. So is it my understanding that None of these fuels have been supplied in sufficient quantity to the engine manufacturers, to Ron Draper, to Joe, uh, to uh, the fuel distributors to actually determine whether or not they meet the standards and everything. Everything's been lab rather than out in the field. Ron, have you had a lot of fuel that you could run through a whole bunch of, of 182s or 206s to say, yes, we've done this on 12 of our airplanes and run them from day one all the way through TBO and been able to tear down the engines and the airplanes to find out if it's compatible or has the fuel just not been available? Hey, Fred, thanks for the question. I think that's kind of the purpose to call, just to clarify where we're at. We're all excited about this and we're optimistic it's going to work, but we have tested nothing to date. We've been uh, trying to acquire the fuel and the ability to test the fuel and have been uh, unable to do so to date. So we can't uh, endorse or or speak good or bad about it until we our engineers test it and we fly the heck out of it. I would just add a couple of things, Fred, though, that uh, there is one OEM uh, serious, and I think uh, Robinson is starting to burn some fuel, but there's no volume of this fuel available, what Ron's point is, and it needs to be. And I think the confidence building that Lurio talked about and the FAA funding some for this is the next steps where we run parallel tracks here between the PAFI program and STC program. Whatever fuel gets there needs to get burned as quick as it can in a controlled environment so we can see and experience what science says should work, but let's find out in fact if it does. All right, great. Um, Julie, would you go ahead? You're still on mute, Julie. I'm not the only one, JP. Um, so uh, we do have a current fuel in the field, at least uh, in a limited capacity. That's the Swift 94 UL that uh, has gone through the ASTM process to my understanding. So it's meeting that spec. It is being produced at least in some quantity and it is out in the field. Um, first of all, you know, where, where is that difference between, you know, and I, and some of this is just to walk back through so that we have clarity. What's the difference between the ability to get that out into the distribution channels and the current, you know, higher octane products? And also, you know, it, what was the testing path? that was followed with the various manufacturers, Lycoming, uh, Techstab, et cetera, to have some confidence and get to the point where they are actually distributing that fuel. You want me to take that? Yeah, go ahead first. I, I was going to, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I think I'd just say that, you know, the 94 has been, a spec has been around for a long time. Yeah. It's just being made more recently by, by Swift and, and for sub call it 200 horsepower engines, it's, it appears to be a pretty acceptable result. I think the, the one thing that you know, we'll see some states and some activities where they're going to, you know, roll out at a higher level, 94. We think that's great, 
but there is a risk of, of misfueling, which is not uh, insignificant by putting 94 in the wrong engine. But it has been a spec that's been out there for a long time. Go ahead, Larry. No, I think I was going to make the same uh, point that you did, that um, talking to the 91 and then 94, it has been through a, an ASTM standard, so the availability is um, going to be a, a little bit easier once it, it moves forward the process. And I, Julie, I just add, we, we're watching uh, what's happening in Colorado right now, and, and I think we're very encouraged by it because there's, uh, at Centennial, the community got together to incentivize another tank to be able to to deploy the 94, uh, the Swift 94, but they are, as Mark said, it's so important to be able to keep 100 low lead available until we, we get to the 100 octane like solution. And that's, you know, diff that's different than how a couple airports that we're all very familiar with in California are, are doing it. And that's where we really get the safety concerns of misfueling uh, really crop up. So our, again, our compliments to what they're doing in Colorado. And, uh, I think that that formula may be repeated at Rocky mountain, uh, very soon. Can I, I just want to add that. I think Pete made a good point is, um, there's that we've been talking, there's, there's concerns, safety concerns on the aircraft side, the uh, operation side, the production side, and it's also the distribution side, but it's also then when it gets out to use, because, um, it, we need to make sure that we've got things timed right. And again, I, I, I want to emphasize, and I'm relatively new to this game. I've been in this now for a year, but I can see it. And, you know, it, there is a, a strong desire by all the components and players here um, to try to meet the goal and even exceed the goal. But we need to do it first with safety. And doing one aspect and pushing one aspect as it would be, and maybe I'm not supposed to be saying this, but you know, airport action taking unilateral action may actually end up having a safety impact. And we're really trying to educate all the components that have to play together to get synced up right so that we can ensure that we all have the safe system. That's the main thing, because that's what we want. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Janice Wood, you did have a question in chat. I just wanted to see if you still wanted to answer. I believe kind of Fred may have stole that question a little bit. Yeah, Fred got it. It's fine. Okay. Anybody else? Well, go ahead. Andre, thanks. I'm Rob Hackman with the uh, Experimental Aircraft Association. Work for uh, work for Jack. Um, I wanted to go back to the question that Fred had about the fuels being provided for the. Uh, engine and airframe manufacturers to be able to do a lot of testing. Um, just to clarify, again, two different paths for a fuel to get an authorization to be used in the aircraft, the PAFI program and the STC program. So the two fuels that are in the PAFI program, Fred, have uh, supplied, and fuels that have gone through the PAFI program have supplied significant amounts of fuel to be tested in that program. A lot of that testing was either done by the FAA at the tech center or by the OEMs through in-kind agreements. So those OEMs that are participating in the program have had insight into those fuels. Some of those fuels in the past have not been successful in getting through. Uh, the ones that are in today, the OEA, OEMs have some visibility through their technical folks, both in the testing that's being done and in the results that are coming out through those not, uh, NDA agreements. So there is visibility there. Uh, that includes both detonation testing and endurance testing. So the goal is to do that data on those fuels through the program before we send wide amounts of fuel out to the OEMs to be able to run their own tests, that type of thing. We want to have some assurance that it's going to be successful. The challenge that I think we heard Ron and some others talk about of not being able to see or have visibility into the fuels comes a little bit more from the STC side, where the STC program, by its nature, is proprietary between the FAA and the applicant. Both the components in the fuel are proprietary, but also the certification program that's used to be granted the STC. Um, so there, there's less visibility, and I think that's what we're hearing the community all the way out through the amateur built community saying is we need more visibility into those fuels to have a better understanding as to how they're going to be able to work. In the case of our community, as Jack alluded to, the amateur built community, we effectively are, are our own manufacturers. We have to make the decision as to whether that fuel is going to be safe in our airplanes. Fuels that come through the PAFI program 
as part of that fleet authorization, that fleet authorization not only is going to provide the information for type certificated aircraft of what they need to do to be able to operate on the fuel, but it's also going to provide the data that an amateur built aircraft owner needs to be able to look at his airframe and engine and decide whether it's safe to operate on. What Jack alluded to on the STC side, it's not to say that the fuels won't be used or safe to be used in the amateur built community. It's just currently we do not have a path to where the amateur built community gets that data to be able to make that decision. That's something that's going to have to be addressed. So the overarching conversation around the visibility into the fuels and the process that's being used really is the difference between PAFI where the OEMs and the community are part of building that process and the STC where it's a proprietary. Not to say one is right or one is wrong. The goal is how do we get fuels if they go through the STC into a place where there's visibility into the fuels and the process that's used so that we can all be comfortable with it. So I just wanted to clarify that there's a distinction there about the visibility and we're not quite ready to send mass amounts of fuel in the PAFI program out beyond what's being done both by the OEMs and the tech center, because that's the testing that needs to happen before we do that. And, and Rob, I just want to add, Rob and Walter have been at this from the beginning. I mean, they're well, well past the decade into being able to look at that. So for our friends in the press, uh, Rob and Walter really have the, the corporate knowledge going into this, but one of the other elements within the PAFI program that was set up originally is not just the, the engine and airframe and materials cap compatibility there, but also on the whole distribution chain that Kurt was talking about. So, you know, we, we also need to be able to look at what rail car uh, liners look like, seals, fuel trucks, above ground and in ground storage tanks. And that's, again, as Kurt was talking about, transparency is so important because we've got to make that an element that is part of the PAFI program. We have to make sure that our SDC fuels and particularly those not used in the ASTM program be able to have the those checks when we do this confidence building exercise. Yes, and I and I was just gonna thanks Pete. And I was gonna say that Rob actually did really well explaining that and he indicated too, you know, as we're doing the testing, you asked, going back to I guess full circle back to the question Fred you asked. There are large amount of fuels when you're doing lab testing it's typically small amounts as you're doing the testing and you're gaining information and you can tell we're still iterating and it's been occurring in PAFI because PAFI has been going on for a number of years and it's been uh, it's been a long process a good learning process we're taking those lessons learned trying to work it with an alternate path just so that we can open up the the um, the options you know be able to try to meet the goals and so even though STC STC's got is one component and there are still components of what still has to be done and I think together, even in these forums through Eagle, we've been transparent in the sense of talking through where those touch points are and what's missing. As we just talked about, you know, we can we can replace it and even if it's proprietary, maybe the best fuel ever. But if it causes a same, another hazard, that has to be addressed. All these different components have to come into play together. So no 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 solution is perfect yet. But I think what's been for me exciting is, and maybe this goes right into the closing because we're on the hour. I've found that the interface and exchange of information. In the end, we all come to the same point as saying that we have to know what each other stakeholder investments are. What's the what's the concerns we have? And we have to address it holistically. We can't do one without the other for a compromise because it's a holistic system from an STC manufacturer, STC fuel, a PAFI fuel. I mean, the OEMs, uh, the distribution, the airport liability, everything that goes along with it. There's there's a, a lot of considerations that we're starting to get on the table and, and put together with the right information so we can move forward. I mean, that's the real goal. And I don't want to do it uh, on a time scale. I'd rather do it on a safe manner. And that's what's most important. I think, Larry, I'm just going to add just a two seconds to that, because I think we're just about timed up. But I think from the press's perspective, this is urgent. You know, the EPA is going to come up with their endangerment finding probably sometime later this year. It's going to encourage those that don't like airports to start closing airports. We want to be as environmentally conscious as we possibly can. And that's why I think the urgency of being flexible and trying to use whatever learnings we can apply from STC or PAFI. PAFI's been going on for a lot of years and we've learned a lot, but we still don't have a fuel through that process yet. If we want to get a fuel to our, our members, to Jack's members, as quick as possible to get this off our back and be good citizens. So I urge everybody on this call to think about how we can move faster, flexible, and try and drive this process to an end way before 2030. The clock keeps ticking. 
we have everybody on board. Thanks. Yeah. Nice. Thank you all. I'd like to thank everybody for, for coming today. We are available for any follow ups. So please feel free, feel, feel free to email me and uh, we can set those up and, uh, you know, we will kind of continue to update you as, as much as possible throughout this process. Thank you.